The goal of education is to open worlds to children, to nurture that inherent curiosity, to allow students to chase after dreams. And too often in a kind of a, a rigid kind of factory model of education that many people other than myself have written about, right? Um, sure. It's about conformity. Um, I have a little saying that I use sometimes. So the A kids work for the B kids in the C kids companies. But I'm trying to say with that is that it's a system that rewards compliance. It rewards right. everybody who's coloring inside the lines. Classical Conversation Studios presents Refining Rhetoric with CEO Robert Portens, a podcast where faith, business, politics, and classical education meet. Join us as we use the classical tools of rhetoric to seek truth in every arena of life. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Refining Rhetoric. Today, my guest is Frank Edelblu. Frank is fighting for family values as the New Hampshire Education Commissioner appointed by Governor Sununu in 2017. He served in the New Hampshire House of Representatives and is an entrepreneur with a background in finance and accounting. He and his wife, Kathy, homeschooled their seven children and have six grandchildren. So a rich man for sure, at least according to the biblical definition. Uh, Frank, welcome to the show. Happy to be here and good to spend some time with you. Now, Frank, uh, if you are homeschooling your kids, you must be like one of the early pioneers. What prompted you all to decide to homeschool? And uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, sure. Um, so... I don't really think of ourselves as being one of the early pioneers, although we um, probably started our home education journey, you know, more than 30 years ago. Um, but there were even people before us, right? So when we were yeah. getting into it, we weren't the first, but we were certainly in that cohort of people who, uh, you know, families would say, you're homeschooling? What does that mean? Like, what does that even look like? So there wasn't really, um, you know, broad understanding and knowledge about home education and what it's all about. And um, I'll start out with, like, I'm, I try to be pretty um, deliberate in my vernacular. And in that, like, I try to use the term home education instead of homeschool, right? Because right. my goal really has always been not to recreate school at home, but just to recognize that, you know, there's a lot of educational pathways for kiddos and trying to find ways to get there. Um, but I did not always have that. Uh, both my wife and, and I um, both attended public schools growing up. Uh, we both attended public university. Um, and, uh, you know, we I don't think homeschooling necessarily started out as being on our radar. Um, kind of early in our marriage, my wife had a friend who said to her something quite provocative and a little bit challenging, says, if you love your kids, you'll home educate them. Right. And I think my wife was like, what? You know, of course I'm going to love my kids. Everybody loves their children. Um, and uh, so that got her on a path of exploring what this might look like and uh, trying to see like, OK, you know, what are the the reasons that we might do something like this? And I think, um, you know, the more uh, time we spent looking at it, the more it became obvious that this was something that we as a family uh, were interested in doing and wanting to do it. Um, not simply because we loved our children, although we absolutely love our children, but in another sense, we had kids because we love kids, right? We got seven of them. Both I come from a family of six. My wife comes from a family of six. So, you know, be, having seven just sort of felt natural. Um, but as well, like you have kids and what's the point of having kids and then sending them off someplace, right? Like you want to spend time with them. You want to grow up with them. And, uh, and so that was one of the advantages that we saw in the ability to home educate our students, our children, uh, being able to spend time with them and, and, uh, and watch them grow and experience life with them. Um, you know, we had to overcome kind of there's that um, initial like, I can't do this uh, idea in your head. And, and truthfully, I think that the I can't do that is implanted by the quote, and I'm putting quotes around this, my little air quotes, uh, educational experts who say like, well, you know, if you're not an expert, you can't possibly educate your kids. And um, my advice to families who think you can't do it is you absolutely can. In fact, it is an incredible journey of, of unlearn, uh, you know, of unlocking, you know, uh, worlds, you and your child together, right? So it's like you're both 
uh, embarking on this journey of discovery and learning. And and your learning hasn't stopped by any means. And so you kind of have that advantage. And I sometimes, like, I think about it, like, look at our littles. Like, if you, you know, like, before a kid shows up in a traditional school setting, right, maybe they're showing up at five or six years old, I mean, they've, they're little learning machines. I mean, like, these kids right. have already mastered an oral language, and they didn't have any teacher, they didn't have any classes, they didn't know anything, they just learned stuff, right? And so, you know, the question, uh, you know, is, you know, can we just keep that journey going, keep that journey of curiosity, keep that journey of exploration, keep that journey of, you know, what is the big question and what is the big answer in life and just keep pursuing it. And so um, that's kind of how we got started on our journey. And um, we do, like we've always said, so we did home educate our kids, you know, throughout school. So, you know, through high school, um, all of our, our children, um, you know, went on to some type of post-secondary activity. I still have two in post-secondary right now. Uh, <laughs> looking forward to that part ending as well. And, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, when you're when you're on that journey, again, just the opportunity to explore and, and spend time with your kids is just great. So, Well, I love that uh, you guys have seven kids because that's, uh, you know, one of God's favorite numbers. And, you know, we only have three kids. So I always say I'm not sure we're a real homeschooling family because, you know, we only have three of them, but, uh, you know, we have what the Lord's given us. And I loved when you said that, you know, you don't really like that idea of homeschooling, um, because we like to call it home-centered education here at Classical Conversations, because we don't want to bring that failed school mentality home. Um, You know, that's what most of us know, and, you you know, the Bible says we return to what we know uh, best, and, of course, uh, we need a relationship with Jesus and to be able to look at the world through different lenses and uh, I think, uh, you know, you really embody that very well. And, uh, you know, that really encourages me to hear, you know, many of the same things that we're saying. And, you know, the whole idea of, like, you're ch- you taught your child how to talk. Like, even though you might not realize that's An entire what oral language, exactly, <laughs> <Yes>. right? <Yeah. laughs> but you can't teach. And one of the other things I like to tell parents, too, is a lot of these educational experts have a Ph.D. and zero kids. So they have no real-world experience. Many of them don't even want to have kids. They feel like it will be a drag on their career, a drag on their personal ambition. So why would you listen to someone who's not even tried to or even wants to try to raise their own children? Um, Instead, you should listen to God because God gave you those children, uh, and uh, therefore uh, he believes that you can raise them well. Uh, yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add to that is, I mean, again, you want to be open to various kinds of input and 100 percent like ours is a Christian centered home education environment is what we were doing. And that's because of that's who we are. Right. So that is kind of the ethos right. that we bring to everything we do in life. Um, but, you know, like if some, you know, God speak to us through other people. Right. So there could be some Ph.D. guy who has a good idea and I'm not going to reject a good idea just because they're a Ph.D. with no kids. But I guess the point that you're making sure. really is. Like, who's going to love those kids better than you are, right? And it doesn't matter what educational setting they're in. I mean, you know, parents love their children. Again, of course, there's some exceptions, but those are exceptions, not the rule. And so how do you take that uh, commitment that you have to this new life that you've brought into the world and help to kind of nurture and and grow them up, uh, you know, into young adults that can be, uh, you know, launch themselves? I sometimes, I tell people, like when your kids are young and they're acting up and stuff like that, I'm like, that's why God gives them to us for like decades. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, meaning if they just came, you know, if they were born and they were perfect right out of the thing, they wouldn't need us. But that's the whole point of parenting. And and that's the reason we had kids is to be able to uh, be engaged in that formation that takes place in those little young lives. So um, what a what a uh, a rich and rewarding thing to do in your life. Right. Um, you know, you, you, it is just, um, you know, I, I used to make fun sometimes like this is when we, you know, my kid were younger and I'd be talking to friends of mine and they almost they had this kind of perspective like, gee, we're not sure we're either going to get like a fidelity, you know, investment or we're going to have kids. I'm like, those are not equivalent things. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? Like, um, like, this, like a life is just so much different than some material thing. And I think that's one of the obstacles that people face as well in terms of home education. Right. Um, you know, they set themselves up on this track of, you know, of material things around them, right? And they have to have all these mm-hmm. things. And so then next thing you know, uh, both mom and dad are out having to work just to pay the bills on all the things that we have. And so then you need that school environment because, 
you know, whether or not they're educating their, your kids, they certainly are caring for them while you can head off to work. Um, and so I would encourage people that, you know, the, sa- the financial sacrifices that you might think that you're making relative to a home education program, um, you know, are they pale in comparison to the, uh, the return on investment you're going to get by investing in uh, the lives of your children. Yeah, I say a lot of times the decisions that uh, parents make when they're dual income, no kids, and the lifestyle they build for themselves, not thinking about the future, restrict their future opportunities or choices because of uh, those decisions and they weren't just thinking long term. One of the things that you did while homeschooling was run and, and grow a business, I think an international business, and we have a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners that listen to this show you know, what are some advice that you can give or what are some benefits of homeschooling and running a business and, and how did you manage uh, both of those uh, with the help of your wife? So I, I'm not sure that those are necessarily compatible, right? Like, so when you're running a business, it's a lot of work. Um, I think you probably know that yourself, right? Yeah. Um, so, but, you know, so you don't want to be shy about hard work. And then quite frankly, you're modeling for your children a life of, um, you know, being committed to working hard. Um, you know, one of the things I am proud of as a parent of grown children is to, like every one of my kids, they show up for a job and they can outwork anybody who's there, right? Because they just understand um, the value of, of hard work and, and trying to get things done. Um, you know, sometimes people think like the entrepreneurship life will afford you more flexibility and and latitude in terms of being able to invest in in home education. Um, I don't know if that's universally the case. Uh, in, in, it's more just you have you just have to wake up earlier and stay up later, right? Your days yeah. get longer is, is essentially what happens. Um, you know, but you know, you have to be uh, to do what God's called you to do in terms of your vocation to provide for your family. You know, we certainly are called to provide for our family. Um, God is going to create pathways for us to provide for our family, and we need to be willing to, um, you know, accept that pathway and to live with it and live in it and uh, and um, do it, you know, uh, to honor the Lord, I mean, with our lives. Yeah, absolutely. I love that, and it's something that we've talked about a lot in our show in previous episodes. So uh, you were called, uh, I guess, by Governor Sununu to be the New Hampshire Commissioner of Education. Uh What's the responsibilities of the Commissioner of Education, uh, and uh, how long have you been serving, and what are the things that you're working on? Yeah, so I have been serving for, this is now entering my eighth year in this role. Um, it is kind of cool that, and, and there's a guy, Dean Kamen, who's a business guy here in the state of New Hampshire, who always laughs. He goes, I can't believe we have a homeschooling dad who's the Commissioner of Education, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think what happened is because of my background, both my background in entrepreneurship, right? And so in finance and accounting, not specifically education, my uh, background with home education, like I brought some perspective to this role that I don't, that, that quite frankly worked to my advantage, right? So I was the guy who come in and I didn't have any sacred cows. Like you're not allowed to do that or you can't do that or don't touch this. I, you know, everything we were doing, I could just say like, why do we do it that way? Like, that seems like a silly way to do it. And so I could question everything. And, um, you know, in some circles that becomes very uh, frustrating and, and quite frankly, uh, sometimes even antagonistic um, in the sense that, you know, people have been doing it stuff the same way for uh, literally for decades, right? And so some guy right. comes along and says, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. Why are you doing it that way? And, uh, you know, and so they challenge that quite a bit. But the flip side of that is that we can create all kinds of different, um, you know, innovative kinds of things to try and help education. And so probably one of the things that I have driven the hardest is um, really, and, and this I can say in a show like this, it doesn't, the vernacular doesn't necessarily work outside of the context of maybe a Christian show, but it's like, it's really focusing on the humanity of, of children and students, right? Like these are mm-hmm. individual humans. They are not widgets. They are not. Uh, you know, just because they were born on a day plus or minus 180 days are somehow uniform, um, you know, and so what we want to make sure happens in education, kind of as I described in my home education program, the goal of education is to open worlds to children, to nurture that inherent curiosity, 
to allow students to chase after dreams and and stuff like that. And too often in a kind of a, a rigid kind of factory model of education that many people other than myself have written about, right? Um, sure. It's about conformity. Um, I have a little saying that I use sometimes um, that it sometimes is uh, it, it irks people who are, have been in the education world for a little bit of time. I basically say like, you know, the C kids or the A kids, the kids who are getting A's. So the A kids work for the B kids in the C kids companies. Um, <laughs> and essentially what I'm trying to say with that is that it's a system that rewards compliance. It rewards right. everybody who's coloring inside the lines. Um, and many of those C kids are great kids, but they're just like, you know, this game of school, this gamification of I follow your rules and therefore I get a good grade. They're like, that's stupid. I just want to learn things. Right. I mean, I, I'll yeah. tell you a story. I have a kid in the state who um, he took algebra uh, one year and he failed it because he didn't hand in enough homework assignments. So they made him take it again the next year. And the next year he failed it because he didn't, he skipped class too many times. And then the third year they made him take it again. And he failed it this time because he got into an altercation with the teacher. Um, mm. And then they were going to make this kid take, the, the, take it again. And so we're like, he might kill the teacher this year. Like we better not do that, <laughs> right? You know, at this point in time. And so we found an alternative program. We brought him into this alternative program. He took an algebra test and he knew the algebra, right? Like he had already learned the stuff, right? And yet we were going to somehow, you know, make this child go through this for a whole nother sit in the seat for 180 days on material that you already know because you haven't followed all of those requirements that we put in place. Um, you know, when you look at the world, there's there are many examples, um, you know, whether it's you know, Steve Jobs at Apple, Bill Gates, you know, Elon Musk, like all these guys who are just like incredible performers who value education. And yet what you've seen happen there is that, you know, they said, well, not that education. Like I can get educated in a lot of different ways without checking all of your boxes. And um, and so probably more than anything else, that's what I have been driving is just to bring the humanity back to let children pursue mm -hmm various pathways to get to an outcome rather than um you know make it feel like it's a, it's a it's a definitive thing you know because i mean it, any, anybody who's an adult knows learning is it happens forever like you never stop learning and so the idea yeah. that we you know we create this model that says okay so you're done learning you graduated high school like well, wait a minute that's when learning starts right you know um so you're trying to just like drive that home as much as possible. Hey everyone, I want to briefly interrupt this program to tell you about one of our newest Copper Lodge Library uh, releases, Pride and Prejudice. It is a resource that our families read in the Challenge Program. Our Classical Conversations multimedia company has produced this new Copper Lodge edition of this beloved, beautiful book that uh, so many of us love and enjoy. Me not being one of those as a teenage male, not my favorite one that my mom required me to read, but uh, as an adult, I definitely appreciate the story much more. And uh, it's a beloved classic novel. And the wonderful thing about the Copper Lodge Library books is it has footnotes that include, you know, definitions, pronunciations, historical context, and really just helps bring the story to life, as well as wide margins so that students uh, can take notes and really have that conversation with the author. And I bet I would have enjoyed these books much more as a teenage male had I had these details provided for me uh, in the books that I was reading. So students will be discussing Pride and Prejudice inside of our Classical Conversations communities. And of course, uh, for those who might not be in CC, uh, it's a wonderful book that you should include in every curriculum. So you can learn more about the Copper Lodge Library series at copperlodgelibrary.com and go to classicalconversationsbooks.com to purchase one today. Now back to the show. Andrew Kern has a saying that we like to borrow that says, uh, children are souls to be nurtured, not products to be measured. I think that kind of speaks to what you're saying. And amazingly, you know, probably if you went back to the 40s and 50s, uh, you know, the humanity of the child wouldn't be something controversial, but uh, it sounds like it might be uh, today. And like you said, we want to create 
you know, lifelong learners and uh, people that, uh, you know, have the tools of learning. And I know, uh, and I don't know what New Hampshire statistics look like, but I know like in general, post-COVID, you know, chronic absenteeism is up, you know, exponentially in uh, government-run school systems. And I'm like, well, for one to two years, you told the kids they didn't need to show up to learn, and kids really value their time, and you're obviously not using their time well, um, just like uh, you pointed out with this one student who knew algebra but was, you know, continuing to have to take the course again because they weren't jumping through the government uh, mandated hoops. And, uh, you know, I like like you're saying, we I like to say uh, A students work for C students and B students work for the government. So um, <laughs> same thing, uh, similar philosophy there. So, um you know, part of your responsibility, I assume, is to try to help these, help the New Hampshire uh, government-run systems uh, be more effective and run better. So can you tell us a little bit maybe about uh, what some of the things that you've been able to accomplish inside the system and uh, some of the maybe wins that you have there for those uh, people that are opting into the government system? And what are some of the frustrations, things that you can't get through uh, because of the bureaucracy? Yeah, so let me spend some time on this because um, it's a great question. Um, and for, so first of all, I'll tell you that the system itself is very resilient to change. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. Like if you think about the people who work in formal education, you know, these are individuals who went to school and they liked it. So then they went to post-secondary, they went to college to study education, and then they came back and they ran it. And when you come to them and you say to them, hey, this isn't working for too many kids, they're like, well, I don't understand. It works great. And that because their experience, like it's hard as a human to get outside your own frame of reference, right? So when they look at it, they're like, I don't understand why it's not working. We'll do more of what is not working because it's got to work eventually because it worked great for me. That's but I mean, like if you think about it, that's their experience, right? Right. <laughs> um, another resiliency factor is I, I, one of my favorite things I like to do is I'll go in and I'll be speaking to a group of folks and uh, I'll say like, you know, so how many of you went to school, right? And every one of them, everybody went to school, right? So everybody's raising their hand. So like even those individuals, they think they are, they, they have some degree of expertise. Like I experienced school and I want you to experience school. I mean, I have been in a community that has 13% proficiency, right? 13%. That means that, you know, there are 87% of the kids who are not meeting our expectations and our aspirations for them. And the parents are arguing, you know, if that high school was good enough for me because they went through it, it's good enough for my kid. And I'm like, it wasn't good enough for you. Like we yeah. let you down and you don't know it, but we let you down. Um, so it's hard to change. And then the other thing that people don't realize is really the history of change in uh, education. And uh, I mean, it goes back to like starting in 1964. I won't take too much history here, but in 1964, we got the Coleman report, right? This was 10 years after the Brown v. Board of Education decision. We had desegregated the schools and everybody said like, I don't understand what's going on. The black kids are underperforming, right? And how could that be? We've desegregated the schools. So they studied it and they came up with some answers. In typical fashion, those answers got put on a shelf and we haven't done anything with them. But the next year in 1965, we had uh, President Johnson uh, declared his war on poverty. And that was the first time that we put federal dollars into education, substantive federal dollars, um, with the idea that if people are educated, then they won't be poor. And so we started the war on poverty. We're going to educate everybody and we'll have no poor people left. You know, that was followed in 1983. President Reagan gave us a nation at risk. You know, the famous mm -hmm. quote out of the nation at risk history says, you know, if a foreign nation had imposed this education system on America, we would consider it an act of war, right? Not to be outdone as vice president. So in 1989, George H.W. Bush gave us a something which was called the National Education Summit. And the National Education Summit said, you know, we're not meeting our objectives. In the next 10 years, every student will be proficient in math and English and science. And then 11, 12 years later in 2000, 2001, his son, George Bush, gave us the No Child Left Behind. I sometimes refer to that as NCLB PTSD uh, because the <laughs> education world is still in trauma over the PTSD associated with that. You know, and it basically said in 2001, every kid will be proficient in math and English and science by 2014 or 2015 at the time. And then not to be outdone, it's a bipartisan thing. In 2014, 2015, Barack Obama gave us 
uh, you know, the Every Student Succeeds Act, which says that in the next 10 years, every student will be proficient in math and English and science. And I give you that quick history because when I came into this role, like I didn't imagine I was smarter than all these people that have been working on this change for a very, very long time. And I just was like, you know, like if I just keep doing what everybody else has done and expect something to be different, that'd be silly. So really the emphasis that we have here in New Hampshire is I'm trying to change, you know, the, the, what we are as an education system and embed in the system the seeds of change. And so that includes things like, you know, our charter school environment is much more vibrant today than it was when I took over this position um, and creating a lot of options. You know, we have a program called Learn Everywhere, which allows students to get credits for learning that takes place outside of school because we don't really care where you learn, just that you learn, right? We've got mm -hmm. education freedom accounts here in the state of New Hampshire that allow students to let the, let the money follow the student to be able to uh, enroll in education programming. And what I say is that those are very, those are different. Like those are what I refer to as be verbs as opposed to do verbs. Like all these other efforts to change education have been if they would just do this and do this and they're still superimposing some system on everybody as opposed to recognizing humanity and individuality there. But a be verb recognizes that everybody's got a different pathway. And so, you know, as a good conservative, I'm a, I'm a believer in free market principles. I'm a believer in the idea that those free market principles allow a system to adapt. And so like, I'm trying to sow in the system the seeds of change for the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, because I don't know what's gonna happen, but what we need is we need a system that'll adapt. And for the last five decades has not adapted. It has just been the exact same thing over and over again. So I don't know if that helps you understand kind of my, my change thesis that I'm working. No, absolutely. I mean, you know, I. You know, whether I voted for those individuals or not, you know, I do believe that they wanted the best for Americans' children, right? And they probably hired some really good experts, like we mentioned earlier, who probably want the best for the American children. Um, and uh, we continue to get worse results the more centralized those decisions uh, are, are becoming. And so it's cool to hear you say, you know, in New Hampshire, we're wanting to, you know, recognize that uh, it's education happens outside the classroom and you know probably both you and I agree from homeschooling or being involved in our own homeschooling lives that a lot of times most of the things that children learn are from outside the classroom I don't think and, you just said something really profound that that I hear people say sometimes and it just gets overlooked I mean like think about what you just said like we're containing these students for hours every day and yet we know that much of the learning that contributes to their lives, and nobody's ever studied this, maybe happens outside of that environment. In fact, this is one of the issues that came out of the pandemic, right? So all of a sudden we switched over to remote learning, right? And so kids are all of a sudden were learning at home and there was a lot of things that happened in that. But one of the things that became apparent is like you had parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles who were helping the kids with their remote instruction. And so they'd start up remote instruction and, you know, by about 10, 30 or 11, you know, everybody was pointing to put a wrap on it and say like, okay, we covered everything. And so what happened was it was sort of a, a subtle change. People, you know, these adults who were helping this kids, like, what do you mean you're done already? Like it's only 10, 30 in the morning and you've only done like two and a half hours of instruction and, and we're out. And, you know, all of a sudden the light went on and people began to say like, well, that's all they're doing when they're there. It's just, we administer the kids between you know, events most of the time, but we don't have that going on now. So we're done in a couple of hours or three hours and we're out. And and it turned on, it was a light bulb that went on for many people who said like, you know, my expectation was that it was much more, there was much more rigor, there was much more engagement uh, that was taking place than what was happening in that school once those kids got on the bus and, and disappeared and then arrived, you know, six or seven or eight hours later. Yeah, I mean, I think from homeschooling, we typically tell people, you know, two to three hours a day, the older they are, the cl you know, closer to three and maybe a little bit over that uh, formal education is going on. The younger they are, it might actually be just one or two hours a day because that's really all you need to really learn and do it well. And so, yeah, a lot of downtime. I know the federal government did a study like 10 years ago that said like in the average 55-minute class, there's only like eight to 12 minutes of actual instruction going on. And so... Like you said, what are they doing with 
the rest of that time. And yeah, we're uh, administering kids. Like, okay, everybody get in your seats. Okay, everybody take out your books. Okay, everybody pay attention up here. Okay, right. And then yeah, then you get to the instruction. Yes. What are your future plans? Like, um, I know you're not running this cycle for anything, uh, but you've been in the house before. You've been um, working towards. You know, helping New Hampshire have a better uh, government-run education system. Are you going to continue to do that, or do you have uh, bigger plans? Because we always love to see homeschooling parents, you know, embedded in our government because we see those free market principles and the, uh, um, you know, really loyalty to the Constitution as written, <laughs> typically versus uh, some modern interpretation of it. So, do you got any future plans that you can yeah, tell so us don't about? Have any- no breaking news that I can share with you today. Um, it, it is, I am actually on a ballot uh, next week. Um, okay. So this is New Hampshire. And, uh, you know, like, in, and quite frankly, in New Hampshire, like we all get involved, right? You got involved in your community. So I am the commissioner of education, but next week I am on the ballot running as water commissioner in my community. Okay. Um, it will be my fourth term. Uh, I've already served for nine years as a water commissioner in the state, in my town of Wilton. and. Um, you know, because you just you got to be involved in your communities because that's how stuff happens. So absolutely. Uh, so, so it turns out I am running for an office. You know. Okay. All right. Water commissioner, which uh, for most people might not understand that that's actually a very important role. Um, I didn't understand it. I am helping uh, one of our local candidates run for county commissioner, and apparently we're running out of water in our county, and we have to, uh, you know, pipe it in from other counties. And of course, you have a you know, a legal contract that they're going to give it to you. But if we go to a drought, don't be surprised if that, you know. Yeah, exactly. How <laughs> good turn is that contract? <laughs> if, they turn, if they turn it off while the uh, lawsuit goes through the court system to make sure their voters have it. So that's actually a big issue down here. So I know, know that that's important as well. And the things that most of us just take for granted. Well, we've got great um, water in the town of Wilton. So and then we, okay. have, we have the lowest rates in the state. There you go. Doing a good job. Well, uh, is there a website that people can connect with you, or is there a way for people to learn more about the work that you're doing uh, as Education Commissioner in New Hampshire? Sure. Yeah, I w- and I would encourage everybody to go to um, education.nh.gov. So that's education.nh.gov. Um, and on the department website, we've got tons of information out there. Um, one of the um, projects that I had is we created something called iPlatform. Uh, you know, because we sit on vast amounts of information. And if you go to our iPlatform, whether that's financial data about grants and stuff like that happening in schools, uh, performance in schools, uh, you know, demographic information, we've got all kinds of good data out there. We've got data tools uh, that you can do some of the data analytics yourself if you want to do some analysis. Um, But try to use modern technology on these data sets that we're sitting on. Well, Frank, you know, thank you so much for serving uh, your state and uh, the the children and families of uh, your state and you know, all the people that you've supported through your entrepreneurship. And I'm sure uh, you're, like you said, super proud of your children and uh, looking forward to hearing of their uh, future and current success as well. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for being on today's show. Pleasure joining you. Thank you so much. I had a lot of fun talking to Frank uh, today about, you know, his homeschooling experience, being a business owner and now being part of the New Hampshire state government trying to change education for the better and uh, just some of the things that he sees that works and some of the frustration that he has uh, working inside. I loved how he called it a resilient system. So uh, I think today's conversation will uh, encourage you to continue to homeschool or uh, if you aren't homeschooling yet, uh, realize that maybe that system that you went to uh, might not be as beneficial for your children as it was for you. So go to classicalconversations.com today to find out more about homeschooling with us and uh, be sure to share this episode with a friend. Thank you for listening to Refining Rhetoric with Robert Bordens. Want more? Make sure to subscribe so you won't miss an episode. You can also follow us on social media to continue the conversation and visit classicalconversations.com forward slash rhetoric to find out how you can join a local homeschool community.